So welcome to World Childless Week, everyone. Um, well, it's not World Childless Week at the moment, but it will be when you see this. Um, I'm Michael Hughes. I'm uh, a, a third of the Full Stop Podcast, uh, World Childless Week champion, and I'm joined today by three of my brothers from other mothers, and I'll let them introduce them themselves. So how about we go first to Rob? Hi, my name is Robin Hadley. I'm... Uh, a mediated childless man, I guess. I was desperate to be a dad, particularly in my 30s, and I didn't become a dad for a whole range of reasons, economic, partner choice. And in my 30s, I was really broody. I was desperate to be a dad. I was very jealous of uh, men who were dads. And at Stuck with me until my 40s uh, when I started training as a counsellor and for a dissertation I looked at um, broodiness in men and I was found out there were really nothing about that and I guess the core thing for me and my research from then has been was I the only one who felt like that because it seemed to be I was the only one feeling really desperate to be a dad and now I found out uh, I'm not the only one. It is out there. It is common. So you're not alone in your feelings of anger and depression and moods and not quite knowing how to behave or what to say. There's lots of men like that. The issue is there's no real social narrative for us to follow on that. And this is one great thing about World Childless Week and by the, by the Clan of Brothers. It gives us uh, narratives, things to say, things to express, and makes it normal for us to do that. School, how about you go next? All right. Oh, let me, okay. I was on mute. Okay, now I've unmuted myself. Oh, I am Skumbuzo Dube right from Zimbabwe in Africa. I am, I've been in marriage for, for 10 years and we've been uh, trying to have a child and this is our 11th year. And it has been a tough uh, and difficult journey as a pastor who actually ministers to the church members who have children and um, deals with those issues of uh, some, some members who may not be knowing that you don't have a child who will be coming maybe requesting, Lord, oh, Pastor, please pray for me so that I can, I can, I can have a child. And um, so those, those issues come to us as, as, as lost reminders. So I am a, a pastor, I'm also a healthcare chaplain, and I am interested in psychotherapy, and I've done, um, my master's uh, dissertation was uh, uh, dealing with the issue of uh, the experiences of people who are involuntarily childless. And I was focusing on women, uh, so to speak, and I enjoy writing, and I enjoy that is a way of expressing myself in issues of involuntary childlessness. Uh, that's it about me. Uh, I also blog. Okay, I also blog in um, on my on my blog Shunem K. That's where I express my feelings of anger, feelings of uh, disappointment, and all those issues that take place when you are involuntarily childless. Uh, thanks, school. We'll get, we'll get back to what you said a bit later on. And Andy, please. Um, hi, um, I'm Andy. Um, so I've been with my wife since I was 19. We're now in our four, now 40. We've been married for, well, 11 years. Um, 
forgetting where we are with the pandemic. Um, and throughout the whole marriage, we were trying for children, um, unsuccessful IVFs, too many miscarriages to, to remember really or to, to know. Um, and it's, it's been really tough to sort of reach to a point where there's no hope every month. That was the thing, I think, was, as we'll talk, I guess, as we go along, part of the denial was that somehow this month would be the one. And I think that took a lot to accept it isn't. Um, and there's questions around it, sort of, why didn't we start before we got married? We were living together for the 10 years before. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's a complicated journey. So I can understand why people wonder why men don't talk, because it's so messy it's so hard to sometimes find the words to the scripts because for men they aren't really out there and i guess with the clan of brothers with the men matter too they i guess us guys we're trying to create something for for us but also for other men to sort of understand what's going on for them um outside of being childless um i'm a counselor but i don't counselled in this area um, and I'm a PhD student and I'm sort of starting to merge all my sort of interests so I will be presenting on a, sort of a day's walking and how childlessness was reflected in landscapes and can be untherapeutic not just being in nature is good for us but it can also be really difficult for us if we don't own our emotions so perhaps something to discuss more later, but I guess it's that thing of what works for us sometimes isn't always the best thing either in terms of dealing with our emotions. But perhaps I've just dived in quite deep there for an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, um, um, so the guys have mentioned the clan of brothers. So for those out there who are not quite sure what that is, it's a group that we've started to... To, to and welcome childless men uh, who have uh, accepted that they won't be fa uh, won't be fathers, um, and as I think it was Kevin Riley actually said, it's a place to belong, and um, I think that's the best way that we c the, the best way we can explain it. It's a place to belong, uh, and if you wish to express your emotions, there are there are men there that are. Um, Ex extremely uh, compassionate and empathetic because they have been through what you may have. And, and we come from all gamuts of childlessness. Um, so, but it's a closed group and, uh, and we like it that way because again, it's a place to belong and we only want people in there who understand our issues. Um, so I brought the boys together along because um, as I immerse myself into this, into our community, I realise there's a lot of females that find it really hard to understand the behaviour of their partners. Uh, um, and so I, I've tried to get, and I would like to call, say these, these gentlemen here are very brave because the, um, there are a lot of men that would not do this. And we also want to show some leadership. It's okay to express yourself if you need to. So I, I, what I want to throw to you, to all three of you, is uh, a conversation that my wife and I had in, in that when we were going through our worst, our, our most dark times, she said to me some years later, um, why did I never see you grieve? Because I felt so alone. Within our marriage, my wife felt alone because she didn't she didn't think I cared because she didn't see me grieving. So I would like to th throw that out to you guys. Andy, you're not on mute. So would you like to sort of give me your thoughts around that? Uh, That'll teach you for you know, not putting on your mute button. It will. It's because I'm on an iPad, so you'll see my finger stretch like ET <laughs> otherwise. Um, <laughs> So, with us, I can understand, yeah, why your wife asked you asked that of you. I think it wasn't quite as sharply defined for me and my, my wife, but she was certainly 
grieving process and moving towards acceptance a lot quicker than I was. And I, for me, I felt lost when it wasn't happening, but it was from mates or brothers, both of our brothers, we only got one each. But, and I just didn't know really what to do because in, in another way, um, her desire to have a family was there quicker than for me. Like we got married, we said we'll try for kids now. And I was worried about providing about finances, but was, but we we tried anyway. And they needn't have worried about all that. But I think all I think not being on the same page at the start meant my grief process was behind hers. And so we were definitely at different stages. And also for her, it was tears. That was it was obvious when she was upset, but for me, it was anger, and I could snap past the end of a driver when driving or cooking if I knock something or just silly things that would set it off, but weren't the anger. There wasn't about that, it was clearly about other stuff, mainly the childlessness. And because that both upset me and her, I then hid that because I was like, I don't want to be anger. So I'd sort of just be quiet or talk about other stuff or it somehow just didn't get really dealt with, which was unhealthy. And yet, we did have our moments of talking about it. I did have my moments of expressing it. And when I did, I wrote a lot of journaling and I did a few pieces that went public. And in them, there isn't the anger except in one piece. It's, it's much more about the loss, the sadness, about the unfairness, the puzzlement. And it's much more like perhaps how she was grieving. And that almost felt more private to write it down and send it out to the world because I wasn't there when someone interacted with it. So I can see if they didn't hear it, didn't connect with it. Because... Where in person, I think with my wife, it was fine because she got it. But with family, with friends, the spaces weren't there to really discuss it or they didn't get it. Or if they were there, it was like at midnight after too, far too many pints. So then it, it wasn't really a useful conversation. Mm. And so, so yeah, it's, I think I was grieving. It was just in a very different way. And I think perhaps because childlessness is a, it's got more women there and, and more their way of expressing it. it. Could be that almost our way of grieving is unseen and isn't quite understood, and that we do share emotion. It's just perhaps not the same way, and that gets difficult for us if the ways we show it get shut down. Yeah. yeah. Yes. S school. Um, what would you? What are your thoughts on on this? Were in terms of you know, your grieving process, was it something you kept close to yourself, um, or did um, or, or did you manage to to sort of deal with it at the time? The the grieving process uh, basically was uh, determined by my cultural lenses. Uh, when we when we were raised. Uh, we were taught as men not to to cry. Boys don't really don't really cry, and so because of that, um, if you are somebody who is seen to be crying, you are not man enough. You are not standing by the side of your wife, and so so that really hits you very hard. And but inside you will be bleeding, and uh, there will be this. Uh, the anger will be there, the pain will be there, but uh, just because you need to man up and uh, boys don't cry, see, <laughs> boys don't cry, and that, that is a problem. So that, that's one thing that has been a challenge in this journey, that uh, the expectation is that you are supposed to be strong, but the, the, the circumstances that will be surrounding you won't be allowing you to be that strong. The moment you cry, the moment you shed tears, you become 
a source of pain to the one that is supposed to receive your comfort. And uh, in my case, it will be my wife who is supposed to receive my comfort. So the moment I begin to cry, I will be uh, like hating her. So it, it will be easier for me to look for a certain place, I mean, maybe a secluded place to, to cry, to shed tears. And so, uh, we, we've had a number of surgeries um, and, I, and I've been saying to her, I understand we need a child. I understand this, this, is, this is very important that we get a child, but uh, there's something more that I wish, I wish your health was a little bit more better because you've been going surgery after surgery, trying this and that, this and that, and uh, it doesn't really get down well with me. For me, it is more important that you get better than getting a child. And so when you say that, that thing is maybe kind of creates a, some, some sense that maybe this guy doesn't really care about this thing. So, so, so that, that is another challenge, that a crossroad that we come to as, as men to really cry, to really express our feelings. It's considered feminine. Uh, it, it's not something that is uh, masculine. If you are a man, you are supposed to man up. So the grieving process has been stalled and has been difficult because of uh, this cultural lens that we put on as we, as we come to a grieving uh, situation. Mm. Hey, so Rob, what about you? What are your thoughts on, on that, the, the men's grieving process? You know, what was yours like? Well, I think it's still on, ongoing because I think it dips in and out, uh, depending on what, what's happening. I think when I was really, really, really broody in my uh, mid-30s, then it just consumed me, that desire and uh, feeling of failure, of not being on time, of being different and being off track. And uh, there was anger there, as Andy said, um, and there's something around that about action, I think. We're conditioned to, to fix things as men in, in cultures, to go out and do things. So we almost, I hate to say, programmed to, to be active outside ourselves. Um, and I guess uh, women, uh, we're talking very broad brushstrokes, are conditioned to be at home with the internal process. Whereas we're conditioned not to be like that, to actually go and fix things. And we can't fix really not being a dad. And we can't fix our partners if they're going through infertility treatment or we're going through infertility treatment and it's not successful. Um, so that each reminder of not being is a, a point of grief and that can can just be a little point and you can find that's not a problem otherwise it can just fill fill you up and fill your your whole uh view and sense of being so i think with with age because i'm 60 i know you can't believe it but i am <laughs> and you think i'm older thanks um there's something about that gives a bit of distance, but also the chances of me becoming a dad because I'm in a, a marrying in a stable relationship, I want to stay in it. There's very little chance of me becoming a dad. So there's that sort of logical uh, element to it, but there's also a feeling element that actually I am missing out here and it's a missing is part of the grief. I think what Andy and Sibukizu was saying was, so accurate about the the culture and actually there's something missing in culture for men and how they express their internal emotions what's acceptable and what isn't i mean what we're saying is we're we're booking that trend uh may for me what i've noticed is when i'm really struggling with something i go and usually dig a hole in the garden and start doing some gardening and there is something about physical activity 
as a as a process. So Andy was saying about walking. There's something about doing that, and is, is that natural? Is that just in with us as men, or is it cultural that actually we're channeling what we've been conditioned to be into an acceptable form? Um, mm. Yes, yeah, I, I think, I think that's, that's where. I've, go on. Sorry. Yes, yeah. I, I remember when um, Jody and I, Jody Day and I, well. She encouraged me to try and start a group. That's what she did. And I said, well, I'm not quite sure it's going to work. Because men, we're action oriented. You know, we are action orientated. You know, we need to be doing things. And we as guys, actually, I think we bond through that. So if I said to you guys, come, re- come round on Saturday, I'll have a barbie, but I need your help building something you know you'd come over give you some direction you know and that's how we would bond through you know doing something and then barbie and a few beers afterwards again doing something but (laughs) um so yeah it was a little bit um i wasn't quite sure but i think like you said we you know we need to we need to buck the trend because you know, we, we need, guys need somewhere to to express that grief that we've now all talked about, which is quite private. And I think that was, um, that was me. That's why I never showed emotion because, um, like school said about that cultural lens, I found that the only way that I could get through the dark time was to go just to get on with it. I remember having a conversation with uh, Rod Silvers and that's one of the things he said. He just said, just got to get on. That, that's the way I dealt with it. You just got to get on with it. And that's the way I saw it was we just got to keep going quick, quick work through this, work through this. And so I didn't see, I saw emotion as something that got in the way of that. Whereas now, I'm, um, I think in my 50s, I'm, I'm grieving now. And like you say, Rob, it, it, it comes and it goes. I thought that I'd had it under control. And um, then in 2000, no, yeah, 2018, when we we had a trip over to the UK and went to Fertility Fest for the first time, and and I had the opportunity to go to Ireland, and I'll, I'll insert a picture um, when I edit this um, that really I, I thought it was great, but it's it smacked me on the head like a like a baseball bat. We went to a grave of another Michael Hughes because I'm the sixth Michael Hughes. There's my dad, his dad, his dad, and his dad. And one of my dad's cousins took me to the grave of the one that we think may have been the first one, 1800 and something. So there I was standing on the grave of this Michael Hughes, the sixth generation of, and it all stops with me. There is no more. And that hit me like I, I just, I, I, it threw me in a way that I could never imagine it could. And um, yeah, it, it's still, it's actually still hard to look at that photograph. So um, I just hope when people <laughs> look at this, but I mean, it's not, any great piece of you know art but when you look at this there is so much behind this photograph um yeah so like you say it it comes and it goes and i i think um that's another thing we could probably discuss is about how we manage that how do we you know because i think it is something that you well you're always going to live with it and it's sort of about how you manage it how you deal with it. Some of us do it well 
and some of us don't. Um, what about you, Andy? How, how do you how do you manage? Um, to start with, it was very much on my own. So either writing or running, um, both doing things. Writing, there is more being with the emotion. Um, but it was also removed because when I did share the writing, as I was saying, I wasn't there to be met. So I've been lucky that I've not had negative feedback, but positive enough connected with other childless people through it. So that's been really good. But while it helps, I think there's a disconnection with the, the written word rather than say us guys talking now where I can feel a real sort of punch to the stomach when you talked about that greystone and the Michael Hughes and it's stopping. And with the writing, there is that there, but it's not quite the same, but it is really helpful to do for me. And then the running was even more removed in the sense of, I find this with anything when I run, I have something in my head and after a mile, that's gone. So it's good in a sense of grounding me, in a sense of not being lost in the grief, in a sense of being active, trying to move through it, so I'm not just in a lost, dark place and lose any sense of time and sort of purpose. But again, I'm not necessarily with the emotions. And I was, I'm part of a running group. Um, I nearly said it was because not ran this year, really, um, with them because of the pandemic. But it's a fell running group. And it's almost like some people knew about the child business because I've been in and out of the group because the process is in and out, as you guys have said. But at times it did feel like it was, a, it was an elephant on the fells, that it was a difficult being around other people if I wasn't in quite a good spot or if I didn't feel fit enough. And I think it goes back to that cultural lens of that Skew was saying that we can't be weak if we're men. We, and showing emotion, being upset is equated with weakness, which is wrong because it, it isn't. But, and so, yes, yeah, I wasn't feeling fit. I sort of felt more of a failure. I think plugged into the grief that I'm already failed here. I'm less of a man, something like that. And so the, the ways of coping were useful, but they didn't quite help enough, if you like. They were mm -hmm. good enough to get by, but not necessarily to, to grow, to move forward in a, in a positive, purposeful direction. And the thing that I found to help with that is is meeting people is is finding a place to belong as kevin put it in the sense of through twitter through facebook and now through the clan of brothers and having spaces where you can talk about childlessness but you can also talk about hobbies or music or cricket and just know that you're not going to be triggered that you don't have to hold yourself tight hold yourself tense that there's going to be a question about kids or someone's going to bring up what their, their son's done etc etc and that's, that's nice because you get to connect about it, but you also get just to relax and be and not to be on guard. And that is so exhausting. And so I think long-term writing and running will stay a part of it. But I think the real healing for me will be belonging to groups, connecting through these Zoom calls, through messages, and hopefully at some point in person with, with you guys. I think that's the way forward for me. No. Nice one. School, what about, what about you? How, how, how do you cope? What's your secret? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, when Rob was speaking, he, he, he touched something that was, uh, that's really resonated with me. There are so many things that remind us. And, and even Andy spoke about that. And, and Mike, you also spoke about going to the grave and thinking that you are the last Michael Hughes. And, it, and that's, that's something. For me as a pastor, there's something that's unavoidable that I should do. Uh, when children are born, uh, there is a service where they are brought to the church maybe for the first time. And when they are brought to the church for the first time, they are supposed to be dedicated uh, 
and that dedication service is a trigger uh, that I can't avoid. And um, it is a painful trigger to remember that you are blessing these children, but you don't have a child of your own. One day, a, a, little, a little girl aged nine came to me and uh, I was uh, pastoring a different congregation and uh, she had not seen my child. And she came to me and said, Pastor, there's something that I want to ask you. And I said, what, what is it? And says, she says, oh, um, where is your child? And says, no, I don't have, I don't have any, any child. I don't have any. And um, she was so disturbed about that. And she said, oh, Pastor, I will, I will pray for you. I will definitely pray for you. So, so even little children can actually notice that. And to me, that struck as a loss, a reminder that I lost parenthood. When you have lost parenthood. So my fallback plan is to say, when I have done this, when a loss reminder comes, I just get down and I do poetry. I write a poem. I write a poem uh, about the situation that I was exposed to at that moment. And I also maybe blog about it. At one time, um, in, in, in my culture, when you are without a child, and maybe I need to explain this so that you understand, when you are without a child and you die, um, in my culture, it still happens in some places, but in some places because of civilization, it no longer happens. You are buried together with a red to show the societal displeasure. They will throw the red, uh, the red will be tied to your back so that they show that you have discontinued the the line of of growth, uh, the line uh, the line of development you have curtailed it, and so at one time I heard this and uh, somebody was uh, talking about it and it came to my ears, and then to really get over that situation I wrote a poem: "I'm more important than a rodent." are more important than a rodent. So the poetry that I do is self, it's affirm, affirming myself that I'm more important than a rodent. Um, you could consider me as somebody who will be buried with a red, but I'm more important than that kind of a thing. So writing to me has been a way that has really helped me to cope with the situation. Even if I am not yet over with this thing, I understand that uh, one time or the other, sometimes I'm up and sometimes I am down. And the other aspect, I went into academic research on this very phenomenon. I uh, have been following Rob in his academic researches and they bless my soul very well. And uh, they really uh, uh, resonate with what I am, I am going through. Uh, like the one that I can't go to the pub. Anyway, I don't drink, but I can't go to the pub. The, that that, that uh, research really spoke to the essence, the real me. Uh, it was like the men that were talking they are like me. So academic research has also been a, another way of uh, channeling the grief and the pain uh, that I am going through. Just before we pass over to Rob, um, what we'll do is we'll get all your links. So um, the link for your blog school, um, yours, Andy, um, and you're, I know you're building a new website, Rob. So we can um, we can put that there, so people can follow up if they if anything um, you know triggers their interest after this. So, Rob, what about you? Cope apart from digging holes in the ground. Dig well, digging holes everywhere, socially, economically, <laughs> wherever I go, I'm digging a hole. <laughs> um, that that was so so uh, touching. Excuse, really was. Um, and thank you. You know what? I've lost the point. <laughs> what <was laughs> how, the do you, how do you cope? How do I cope? Okay. What, did you, what do you do to cope? <laughs> thank you. Well, I think coping changes with time and experience. I think when I was younger, I didn't really cope. I did 
those things of uh, fight or flight. Uh, I, I'm just going to go off a, a bit now. I know a lot of uh, women say their partner doesn't talk to me. He won't sit and listen and express himself. And if we, we take that thing about fight, freeze and flight, men are sort of conditions to fight or flight. So it's action oriented. To be frozen is like the worst place, the most vulnerable thing for a man. And, and the big thing about men is they don't like to be seen to be vulnerable. And when you're sitting on a, a one-to-one -one conversation with your loved one and she's saying, what are you feeling? It can be, feel very trapped for, for a man. Because to reach down and actually express everything that's there, it's like a volcano inside you. Part of the fear is actually you will explode like a volcano, and that might be like an anger. But actually the, the lava of emotion will come out and burn the partner away and destroy everything around. So rather than risk that, why not go out? as a protective measure, self-protection and protection for the other uh, would be one of the things that, and I think I, I, I did, I did that when I was in my uh, late thirties and my, uh, where I met Marianne, my wife, and she was in London, I was in Manchester, and one particular time, just moved into a house, I was decorating, doing wallpapering, can't stand that. Uh, process. I'm useless at it. I say this before the world. I'm making myself <laughs> vulnerable. I ironing and wallpapering for me. They're for the next world. Okay, <laughs> save them up. I'll do them then. Not for this world. <laughs> and uh, she phoned me up. And that day, my friend had, and my colleague at work had announced that he was going to be a dad. And I was terribly jealous about that. And I was coming back and having to do this wallpaper. And she said, you know, what's well, up? You don't sound very happy. And I went, I just terribly want to be a dad. And because of her situation, she went, well, you know, that can't be with me. So you've got your choice there. Uh, I'm condensing a lot of conversations down to one line there. And at that time, at 38, 39, I sort of looked at myself, you know, I'm in an okay job, but I'm not a go-ahead guy. Where would I go to find a, a partner? Who would want me? What am I bringing to the table? And with somebody I really love and really care about, what am I going to do? So there's a, a choice mm. there, but also no choice at the same time. So the, the coping uh, for me came with sort of a muted or negotiated acceptance. There's a balance, a mediation, like I said, a mediated child, a mediation between actually what I want on the inside and feel for and the outer world and, and where uh, I'm at. And it's negotiating that inner and outer of being that it's, it's a struggle. So how, how do I cope now? Well, I did my research on it. I did my MAM, my MSc, my PhD, all about male childlessness and men's experience. Because you can go in the biological and the sociological, which are all stats and it's all very scientific. But actually, where are men's voices? Where are men's experiences? What are they feeling? What do they do? And that's one reason why we're here, is to supply that uh, knowledge and that, those experiences so other people can understand. And that in doing that, we are making ourselves vulnerable, but it's for a greater good which in a way is very masculine, is to spend the self for the greater good. Um, so what do I do? I do dig holes in the garden. I, I write as well. 
and there is some uh, psychological theory and around why men do that and that is a form of action so I often say you look at men and you just imagine a concrete plug here inside and that's blocking the emotions and so the uh, psychological paper counseling paper I, I, I've read so it's a action orientated therapy is, works better for men writing drawing doing things and that sort of fits in with how they've been brought up hmm. so writing in a way is outside the, the body because you're using your head and you're you're mediating and making it safe for your reader this is what i feel and that might be a real volcano inside but actually to make it so i don't flood and damage you i'll say it in this way and i'll explain it in this way or i'll paint or i'll do poetry so i do a little bit of poetry myself but not very much. I, I do the writing and I've written a, a, a book now and I do things like this. So I think there's something about channeling grief to have a positive effect. Not that it works all the time and sometimes I'm just very, very sad by different things. Um, I cry a lot more as I get older, but I think a lot of men do. Yeah. You do. They get, I've found they get, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe that imposition of a distance uh, when we were younger between what's inside and what, what our social selves are being reduces down. And that may well be down to there's not as much uh, risk for you as you're older. But also, maybe it's also times knocking on as well. I actually I can't afford not to be emotional at that time. So I yeah. hope that helps. I think I've witted on a bit. No, no, it makes, makes perfect sense. Um, and oh, <laughs> I'm just sitting there thinking, oh, maybe that's why I started my blog. <laughs> I've always been a slow learner. Um, but, yeah, I... It, and one of the things that Vicky said to me when, when I, cause I used to write, I used to write it. Um, it's now, uh, ghost written by Vicky. You know, she, she'll do the, she'll have, um, you know, um, yeah, edit and suggest. But, um, I found that quite therapeutic, you know, and I've, n I've never been, I've never been a writer. I've never been that sort of person. Um, I've been, I played rugby, as as growing up and into my stupidly into my 30s uh, that's another story um but um yeah and that was that was always me it was to channel that into into rugby so that was my way of uh, getting rid of all that like andy goes for a you know your first mile and then your you know whatever's in your mind you forget about for me it was rugby because you're absolutely smashed after you get off the rugby field. But one of the other things it, 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 it showed was that cultural lens that Sick was talking about where, um, you know, on the rugby field, you've got to get up. You've got to, you get hit, you've got to get back up, and you've got to keep going. You know, you've, you, you, and you've got to show that that you can't show those vulnerabilities. So, um, yeah, so I've never been academic, um, even though I'm surrounded by ac academics right here. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I, I know exactly, exactly, you know, where you're coming from. And, um, yeah, so I've now lost my train of thought, Rob. So where are we going to go to next? <laughs> Oh, crying, and and I find crying as well. I've I've, cr I don't think I can get through a bloody podcast without crying. It's, <laughs> and it's it I don't, it it amazes me because I I don't set out to to be that way, and then all of a sudden it, it creeps up on you. And I must admit, I'm one of those people that try to keep it keep it down, keep it in. Keep it under control. 
because I don't know what it will look like if I let it out of control. So, yes. Right. Where are we off to next? I'm just, I'm just reading my notes. I can, don't forget, I can edit this out, this bit. Okay. All right. So we've been going for an hour and we might, we might lose, we might lose the interest of some people. So w one other thing, I'll, I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet at the moment. So we're, go we're going across subjects now. But um, the last podcast we did was on aging without children. And I'm, I'm caring for my parents right now. My dad has dementia. My mum has just had a heart attack, and so she needs care. And um, the, the, mess, the mess that they've... I mean, I shouldn't say that, but to try and administer their, uh, try and administer their, their uh, affairs has been quite trying because over the years it's got quite complex and I've had to um, try and wade, my, wade through that, but also wade through the, the government care system. And it's just, it, it really shows that um, as, as they lose their mental capacity, they don't have that wherewithal to actually um, you know, make decisions. Like my mum can't even make a decision anymore. Um, obviously, my dad can't because he's got dementia. And, you know, it's really made me think about um, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for Vicky? What does that mean for us both as we age? And is, is, this, is this a fear... Is this something you guys have thought about? I know you have, Rob, because you're well into this. Um, but mostly to Andy and, and school is, um, what are your thoughts on ageing as a childless person? Have, have you been exposed to, to this thought around, I'll have no one to help me when I get older? Or is it something you've not thought about? I know I sprung it on you because I didn't put that in the notes about this meeting, but um, what what are your thoughts, Andy? Um, it's not something I thought of a lot, to be honest. Um, so just entering my 40s, it's also been a sort of similar time to really accepting to dream of children is over. And so I think legacy... It's like a next step in terms of that will come at some point in terms of the process and the grief. But realising that we won't have children, it's hit me in a sense of things to pass on. So I buy vinyl to listen to my music. And I'm like, part of me is like, why do I do it when you can hear it just as well on Spotify? Say, And I was like, well, it's for me. It's what I do. But I always saw also that I would pass my music on to my children, my love of it. Hopefully they'd play instruments better than me. They could be in the band I never was without living through them as well. But there was a sense of the music, I collect it and it will go to someone. So it sort of shocks me to think that at some point it could all end up in the skip. Hopefully it'll end up in something like Oxfam. But there's that sense of legacy of like the music, the books, the writings, our home. That will just disappear or go it'll probably go to our nieces but it feels really sad that there isn't someone really connected to maybe in time we'll connect more to our nieces there is a distancing for me with my brother we're opposite ends of the country but it feels tough that yeah because legacy i know is there's people in the future to care for you but it's also people talk of all I got this from my granddad. It's something they hold. It's really important. Memento, and it's like that's not going to happen. No one's going to quite see the joy of this battered ninety-nine p album I got from a charity shop, and really get it. And in a way, I think your your children are your best hope of that, because you'd have spent time with them if they shared your interest. 
and it's so yeah only in that way in terms of what i leave behind and then so i i've swung between why am i doing it i should just listen digitally and then going well what else am i spending the money on why not treat myself why not give myself that self-care and i don't know about the future in terms of age and that kids i think perhaps i'm just not in that space yet i'm i'm sort of i'm a counselor i've gone back to being a student doing a phd <laughs> i don't feel 40 in some ways <laughs> but i also feel more mature than i was in my 20s when i did my first degree and so maybe yeah, in time it will it will shift to sort of that legacy to parents not being well or needing more support and the moment both our parents are okay but it will yeah we i don't know really how i feel about it at the moment oh that's uh, no that's that's fine it's actually quite interesting it might even be sort of a you know that um i'm finding it very hard to to get people switched on to it and I think it's not until you've experienced, you know, looking after someone that 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 you've actually sort of get switched on. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, it, yeah, look, it's really interesting to hear your the way that you're, you know, it's not something you thought about as someone in your forties. So it's quite a, it's actually food for me. What okay. about what about you, school? Have is there what do you what do you see as as a as a zip? Is it a Zimbabwean? Or yes, yes. yes, yes <laughs> so, yes, so <laughs> as you as you as you age, how will life pan out for a person who doesn't have a family support network around them? I know this is depressing, but it, it's, I've got as I said, I've got a beanie bonnet at the moment. Yeah, and that's that's another difficult. Um, um, question, so to speak, uh, that really uh, bothers one as he thinks about what will happen, uh, who will keep me, and all those things, they really come uh, to, to, to mind. And uh, as, I, as I'm looking at my, my, my parents, also I, res I really resonate with what uh, Mike has said on uh, my parents are my ma my mother-in-law is down. Um, she's Parkinson's disease, and it's uh, deteriorating every day. And um, my my dad as well has got um, some health challenges that are. So I, when I look at that and I say, okay, I can be able to help my parents now, but now when I get to that stage, what exactly is going to to happen so uh, that really uh, becomes a problem uh, because I, I have I am seeing what is happening to my dad and I'm seeing what is happening to my mother in law and so this really uh, comes hard on my grieving process because it really becomes another punch uh, in the holes that I already have uh, so it adds to the pain that I already have and um, there's the word uh, Andy is spoke about. The word is a very common one at this side of the world. The word legacy. Uh, so, so legacy. Legacy is a very, very important element. Uh, what legacy are you going to leave behind? Uh, it is not the poems that I will be writing. It's not the books that I will be writing. It's not the, um, maybe the songs. I, I do write children's songs. Uh, when, okay, when I'm gone, what will happen? I mean, you know, who is going to, to get that legacy? That, that becomes a, a real problem. So, so that's one thing that maybe uh, needs to be reauthored in, in my mind as I look at aging without children. Thanks, school. So, Rob, I know you're big into this. So, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts around this? Sit back, lads. Strap in. We're in for a long, long ride. <laughs> 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 um, right, aging without children. Well, I think you, you've all t touched on it in that really people don't, usually understand their social care systems in their country till they're 
they access them, and particularly for in later life. And uh, in the UK, because we've got the NHS, uh, and that's supposed to look after you from cradle to grave, a lot of people, when they get older, are suddenly confronted with a system that isn't that simple. And in fact, it's very, very complex about uh, how, if you own your house, how much you can pay towards your care. Um, it's uh, a massive, complex thing, a uh, metaphor for which I can't drag out at the moment. <laughs> But it's as complex as something that's very, very complex. <laughs> um, aging without a lot of the the issue for aging without you know, children is there's no they're not represented in policy, and if you're not in policy, you don't count. And if you don't count, you really aren't counted at all. So uh, a lot of policy is evidence based. That goes down to stats. So for, for men in the stats, we know, oh, every country in the world, in fact, knows how many women don't have children because they count how many women do have children. So it's a pretty easy sum to do, even for me, and I'm terrible at stats. <laughs> uh, however, we don't, most countries, with part, the exception of Norway, hooray, stats Norway, don't collect the same data on men. What we can say is, there's more childless men than there are childless women. And in every single country, I think, more or less, that goes throughout the life course. So who is going to look after you when you're older? One of the things about becoming older, no matter how positive spin people put on it, our bodies start to fail. Mm. Things go wrong. Luckily for me, I've kept my looks. Hey, <laughs> that's just me. I'm sorry, it's not you. You're a lucky. You're I a lucky man, Rob. On. You're a lucky I could man. Pass it on to you, I would, but um, <laughs> you know, I have really lost the thread now. Being funny has thrown me. <laughs> I, oh, aging with aging with our children. With our children. Yes. Yeah, so. What happens is because uh, you're, you're not counted in the stats, you don't appear in policy. And therefore, health and social care don't see you as a problem because you're not there. Hmm. But it is a problem in reality. If you go into uh, residential care, there's lots of people who are aging without children. And that includes people who do have children. Because if there's been a split in the family or the, uh, the adult child um, lives in another country or so far away that person is childless, uh, that is an issue. I'll show how important family is in care of older people. In the UK, I think it's something like 85% of informal care is carried out by a family member usually an adult child. So and an adult child mediates between the, the individual and the state or whichever institution they're there. And in, in the UK, there's been quite a few over the past number of years of uh, problems in institutions, South, uh, Midstaff's Health, there's a, a few going through now, of how people have been treated in institutions, poorly treated. And it's the adult children who bring this up, who say mum or dad died or has been uh, not cared for in this way. And that changes that. If you're not got somebody to represent you, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a particular problem for men, I think, because of what we discussed before about men not expressing themselves. Men tend not to access healthcare at the same rate as women. They tend to access it late. And when things are more difficult to treat. Um, so aging without children is really 
a big demographic and political problem actually down in the future. But trying to get the politicians and the administration uh, to acknowledge it is an issue because they just see it as a financial thing. Hmm. They're just going to go, actually, if we look at this, how are we going to pay for it? How is this going to, what policy changes are we going to have to do? And sometimes it's easier not to look at a problem and hope it goes away of its own accord. Uh, and in this case, actually, the population just dies away anyway, and so it's not our problem. Um, that's a very cynical view or very realistic view, whichever uh, one of those ways you want to go. So ageing without children, it is an issue. And at, at 60, uh, my lifespan, I think, uh, statistically is... Uh, I'm going to die probably at 75. Uh, I come from a working class background. I was born in Old Trafford, Manchester, heavy industrialised area. Uh, had uh, chest problems related to all the pollution um, as a, a youngster, but everybody did. Uh, mm. Bronchitis used to be called the Manchester cough <laughs> because, <laughs> because everybody had it. Um, it's a, a humid, damp place, heavy industry, smog would last for five days uh, when I was a kid, seven days, something like that. And when I see smog, I really, you couldn't literally see your, I'm sounding like a really old man now, aren't I? <laughs> uh, in the old days, all this was fields. We had proper pollution then, not like this stuff now. You can breathe it. <laughs> We could see our pollution. Let me see it. <laughs> and did you get a school oh. barefoot? Oh, barefoot luxury. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, yeah, so, but um, uh, your class does affect your health. The poorer you are raised, the more chances are you'll have uh, more health issues later on in, in, in life. So ageing without children, yeah, it's a, a big thing for all countries. Um, so if you look at Japan, for example, they're trying to put things in, in place uh, there. Uh, I think, yeah, and I'm not going to go into different countries because we, I could really go on for a long, long time and I'd be just throwing stacks out and that's not interesting to anyone. Uh, particularly me, I'm bored of myself, and uh, it can cut this beat out. But my wife's cooking something, and I'm absolutely desperate to go and eat. But I'm not going to. I'm going to stick with you. <laughs> <laughs> if only this was smellovision. <laughs> what what what's she cooking? Uh, I don't know. Oh, I do. Yes, um, Stilton cheesecake. Oh, nice. Mm. Mm. Very upmarket. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so what? So, so you can get and have some dinner. Uh, I actually know it'll be. Was it lunch? Lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Food. I'll just. I can't. I. I can't do the time. Um, Two o'clock so, in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so look, I, I really want to thank you guys for 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 having the courage to come on and do this. I think it will it'll be really great to um, enlighten uh, the, the fairer sex, if you will, of the community. But also, I hope the fact that we've been able to have a chat, have a laugh, also shows to other men that, hey, you know, it's okay. You, you know, listen, listen to what we've all talked about. It, it, you know, and it, it, um, come and join us at the Clan of Brothers, if, if you wish. Uh, it's a slow burn. You know, we're all trying to we're all trying to figure out what it means for us. So it's, you know, it's not a full on Facebook group, if you will. Um, but I'd, is there anything you guys would like to add in terms of encouragement to other men, or um, uh, uh, speak to the to the fairer sex in terms of, um, you know, how to perhaps support their partners. How about you go first, Andy? Um, 
Is and you cool? don't forget, I can, I can, I can cut out all the silence as well. So don't worry about that. So if it takes a little <laughs> bit of time to, you know, think of something that's cool. That's fine. I was thinking for for other men that it's knowing you're not alone. I think that was one of the tough things. Is and I've seen this mentioned on the Climate Brothers that it seems like everyone else is having kids when you're trying to have kids, or you're not in the right circumstances to have kids. That it's happening around you. And so I think even if you come and join us at the Clan of Brothers or you join some other Facebook groups or you just sort of pop in and out at looking at this other world, that can help knowing you're not alone with this struggle. Even if you're not interacting in terms of sharing your own stuff but just sort of watching, if you like, that could be a good sort of first step forward. And I'm just thinking of Robin when he says about that volcano and risking our vulnerability when someone says, how are you feeling? And it is such a big question. And I think, for me, I'm not quite sure how you break it down if you were to, if that man is in a partnership, how a woman could ask in a way that allows the man to let off a bit of the steam so it doesn't erupt, it doesn't, that volcano doesn't keep building. But I suppose in one way, if you're the man, because that's the bit you can control, you can't necessarily, you can't control your partner, is let off some of that steam yourself. Like, for me, writing and running helped with that. It's not my cure. It's not my healing. It's part of it. But I think it's just find somewhere to belong and find an activity, find some actions that allows that steam to come off. And so that, if you do have those chats with your wife, your partner, then you're able to say something, even if it's just one or two sentences. You could say to yourself, I'm just going to say something for one minute and that's it. So you don't sort of feel like you've got to tell them everything. You can just say, I'll say one thing. And you could have negotiate. It sounds a bit therapy-like, but you could negotiate with your wife, with your partner in the sense of, you want to know how I'm feeling. I don't really know or it's too risky for me i can give you a few words and that's it's a start i guess that's all we're all trying to just find a way to be with this that'd be yeah my idea no thanks Eddie. that was a that was actually quite quite insightful school what about what what advice have you got all right um maybe speaking to uh, the the fairer sex the women uh, the wives, they may need to really understand the way in which we grieve. And this is very important. Sometimes we are more reserved. They may find it difficult to come to terms with the way in which we grieve and think we are, we are disconnected from, from their pain. So I would love to emphasize that. And then to my fellow brothers uh, who are in this uh, childless uh, journey. I, I just want to uh, emphasize that we are very important in our situation. Although we are defined by the losses that we are in, we, we, we incur. For, for, for instance, we are called childless because of the loss of parenthood. We are more important than the losses that we, we, we have. So a positive self-talk is very important in this regard. If we don't do that, nobody is going to do it for us. We, we've got to rise to the occasion and face the world and actually redefine the narrative and, uh, and uh, look at this issue more differently. When the world is uh, talking ill about us, we have to talk positively about this situation to not to have something doesn't mean that you are less of a human being. When you don't have it, it's because you have not been given that kind of a thing. Uh, having it, it's still the same. You have been given uh, that kind of a thing. So uh, we are not to be defined by the things that we don't have, but we are to be defined by the uh, content which is in our minds and the things that we are able to bring into into life. So I just want to encourage uh, brothers out there. We have a very wonderful group, the clan of brothers. We we share about our journeys and we really talk about the issues that are in our lives without uh, necessarily being judged. That's that's a very important thing. That's a very important thing. And also another thing is to find a channel of releasing the 
emotional hurts that that we have uh, uh, like andy put it before if if there is so much pressure that is piling and the pressure continues to pile uh, there will come a point where you actually explode because there has been no outlet for the anger the frustration or so find a channel that is suitable for you to release whatever pent up emotions that may be inside of you. So um, uh, walk tall, be strong. You are still a man, even if you don't have a child. That's, those are my words. Well, wow, thank you. That was, um, that was pretty powerful. What about you, Rob? What have you got? Oh, I think there's so much there. I think, there's something about look at what your ideals are and actually how many people achieve them and not everybody in fact very few people achieve achieve the ideal in fact so few people achieve idealness that it's almost meaningless so where do you find meaning i think you find meaning in what you do and how you do that uh, we were talking about legacy earlier, and perhaps your legacy will be educating the people who are ignorant about what it's like to be uh, somebody who wanted to be a parent and didn't become a parent or are, sh are going through the process of trying to become a parent. And so speaking and educating, I think for men as well, we're in a bit of a double whammy because we fear being vulnerable and yet society quite often mocks men who are vulnerable. So we're held up to an ideal of not being vulnerable and yet we are vulnerable. And that's by doing this sort of thing and by education, we can knock down that men aren't vulnerable uh, stereotype and that makes it easier and better for men and women and everyone if we just realize we're people and we're partial and limited. Mm. Oh, that was great. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining. Thanks for doing this again. Um, I really appreciate it. And I've actually, I've learned a lot and I thought I knew it well. I shouldn't say I knew it all, but... You know, I thought I was a fair way down the path of acceptance and it's really good to listen to you guys and, and get a different perspective, which I think is something great. And, and I hope that we, we are leading by example on that. So thank you.